Our country's history happened not just because of the greatest figures of the period, but because of a lot of ordinary people getting their hands dirty, doing a lot of very disgusting jobs. This time, the poor souls who had to dish out medieval medical cures, the human hamsters who made cathedrals possible, and how walking in we supported an entire economy. These are just some of the worst jobs of the Middle Ages. is what we call the 500-year period that ended just before 1500. It was the time when the great cathedrals and castles of England were built, the time of the Crusades, of bishops and barons, when Magna Carta was signed, and when Robin Hood and his merry men terrorised Sherwood. The country prospered under the wool trade, then suffered the ravages of the Black Death. But above all, was the age of chivalry. Think saintly noble. Jousting champions and pure maidens. Think battles of bravery. Think deeds of daring do. Think again. Oops. We do tend to have a rather romantic attitude towards the age of chivalry, with knights in shining armour fighting for fair damsels in a misty haze. But actually, that's got far more to do with the sentimental nature of the Victorians than with reality. So what were knights really like? What did they do? Who looked after them? Well, that brings me to my first worst job. Because you didn't start off being a knight. You started off on the very lowest rung of the ladder, being an arming squire. Oh. The arming squire was actually a combination of a valet and a washerwoman. To plumb the depths of the knightly hierarchy, I've come to Arundel Castle in West Sussex. Paul, look at the state of you. You're supposed to be a knight in shining armour. He looks as though he's been hit by a load of cow pats. Would you really have looked like that at the end of a battle? It's probably even worse than that, to be honest. Um, this, as you see, is everyday work for myself. It's pretty grimy, it's wet, it's slimy. I've been in it for probably eight hours. Um, I haven't had a toilet break, so things are pretty hot and sweaty and smelly in here as well. Gavin, you're his arming squire. Yep. When he comes back after eight hours on the field, what's the worst part of the job for you? Basically taking him out of the armour. He might have fallen into blood. He's going to fall into where horses have been cut down. So how do we get it off? Well, let's we'll start with the helm to give him a little bit of air now. So what would you be doing while he was bashing away at the enemy for eight hours? Well, if he hadn't called me to be at his side on the field of battle as well, I would be at the back of the lines, maybe with another piece of armour if, if something was broken, if he got called. I could be there just to run in and help him out. Would you have been trained much before you could do all this? Oh, very much. I mean, I started off as a page, then I would become a squire, and at some point, maybe in my late teens, early 20s, at that point, if I was brave enough and if I had warranted enough, then I would be knighted. So, Gavin, have you got the chance to uh, end up like Paul, a proper full-fledged knight? That's right, yeah. As I have been in his service for many years. So I'd be trained up in the ways of the knight, the ways of chivalry. Uh, he needs to carve my meat as well. Yeah. Beg your pardon? You have to carve my meat. You have to learn how to carve that in a proper fashionable manner. Basically, you're like a Formula One pit team, aren't you? Pretty much so. A good team would be like a Formula One team. You could get in and out of it relatively quickly. The problem, of course, is what you're going to do once you're out of it, and some poor person has to clean all the things, and that's likely to be my squire or any other attendants that I've got within the camp. There are 24 pieces of armour in a full suit, weighing up to 27 kilograms, supported by a leather harness and worn over a hot and sweaty padded jacket. Oh, dear, oh, dear. If you'd been scared during the course of the battle, I wouldn't want to have been down here. And, of course, most of it is running down literally my legs. Yes, all right. That's a step too far for me. In order to clean up the dirty armour, the arming squire would have used vinegar and sand, like this stuff here. And occasionally, they used to include a bit of urine into the mix to give 
added zest. As you can see, it's pretty effective, although it's horrible stuff. It would remove your fingerprints pretty quickly. But this is just the tedium of the camp. What would the actual battle have been like? Before you got to clean out the armour, you had to get to the battlefield, and that could be a nightmare. Take the most famous conflict of the Middle Ages, the Battle of Agincourt. Our squire would have marched 260 miles through France in 17 days, living outdoors in almost continuous heavy rain. Food and clean drinking water were scarce. Dysentery killed far more soldiers on the way to Agincourt than died on the battlefield. The English were hopelessly outnumbered. But the heavy rains created a quagmire for the French cavalry in their heavy armour. They became sitting ducks for the English army's mightiest weapon, the long gun. In the end, it was the archers that did it. They won the battle. Their arrows might not have been able to pierce a suit of armour, but they could kill the horses, and they did. They decimated them. Now, you might think that being an archer was one of the better medieval jobs, but in many ways it wasn't. If you got captured, you had your fingers sliced off, and at the end of the battle, it really did become one of the worst jobs in history. There were no doctors on the battlefield, no St John's ambulance running around with stretchers, so the archers used to wander among the carnage, and when they found someone who was seriously injured, they put them out of their misery. So being a knight wasn't all it was cracked up to be. You could die on the battlefield, and even if you were only severely injured, you'd probably get finished off by a friend. But if you stayed at home, you were just as likely to die from getting a common cold, particularly given the kind of cures that were on offer. In the year 1348, the Black Death swept into England from Europe. It decimated the population and killed around about two million men, women and children in a couple of years. Understandably, people began to get more and more frightened of falling ill. Of course, we know that they were fighting a losing battle against overcrowding and poor sanitation. Remember, in those days, household waste and excrement were just chucked out of the windows into the streets, in the towns and in the cities. But most people had no idea that that was the cause of their problems. And instead, in their panic, they began to rely on a whole host of bizarre remedies. And for us, that means lots more worse jobs. Medical theories were sophisticated, but as we now know, hopelessly misguided. Success rates were terribly low, even before the plague. So any career in medieval medicine was bound to be frustrating. Oh, and messy. Very messy. How about a few of these if you don't fancy walking around with a bottle of aspirin? Leeches. In the medieval period, these were a staple medical treatment. The idea was that as they sucked the blood out of you, they'd suck the badness out as well. In fact, they were so popular that it brings me on to my next disgusting job, leech collector. By the 20th century, leeches were almost declared extinct, so I'm heading for one of the few spots left for a leech safari. Romney Marshes in Kent, with Ranger Owen Lation. Oh, no smell. I'm practically up to the top of my waders in one step. What sort of people would have been leech gatherers? They would have been professionals, but there would have also been people like thatchers, who would have had leeches stuck to them as they were collecting all these reeds and sedges, and they would have passed them on to dealers. You've made a lot of money out of these reeds if you're a thatcher, couldn't you? <laughs> Still have a nice bit of pin money from the uh, leeches on your feet. Apparently, if we jiggle around a lot, then the leeches will think that we're cows or sheep or something, and they'll come down to the water's edge to have a drink, and they'll come up from the bottom and attach themselves onto us. Mind you, they wouldn't have had waders in the Middle Ages. Would no, they? they wouldn't, no. They would have had Scottish women in the northern England, Lake District and Yorkshire. They would have gone to some of these good leech areas, and they would have gone in barefoot into these marshy areas looking for leeches. 
What are leeches? They're worms with character. They really are worms? Yeah, they are. They're the peak of worm evolution. They cross-fertilise each other and lay spongy cocoons in the root balls of vegetation along the shoreline. Yeah. And little leeches will emerge after several weeks. And as they get more and more blood meals over a season, they will get bigger and bigger, but also move on to bigger prey items. Do we use leeches in medicine today? Well, let's say if you chopped your finger off, you'd take your finger to the hospital and have it sewn back on. Yeah. But then what you would have is a leech popped on the end of your finger, which then would have drawn the blood up to the tip of your finger. Is that one? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the hunter has struck. <laughs> I have <laughs> leached. I have caught the leech. I say I'm copping out, really, aren't I? In the Middle Ages, there would have been all these Glasgow girls who were bare-legging <laughs> with these leeches hanging off their legs, and I've got waders on. I will not be overshadowed. Come on. Is it going to hurt? No, it won't. It'll leave a permanent Y-shaped scar on your leg. How big? Oh, only, only the size of the mouth. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, no, he doesn't like me. Oh, for God's sake, do the deed! <laughs> it has just bit me. Yeah. Definitely just bit, bit me. Yeah. Oh my God, he's swelling up. <laughs> how much bigger than this will the leech get as it's sucked to my blood? Well, it depends on much how they feed, but they can increase their size by about five or six times. <laughs> we could be here for some time. <laughs> and these guys in the middle of... Ouch! These guys in the Middle Ages, it's really stinging now. <laughs> when they had an illness, they could have 20 or 30 of these things all around them. That's right, I mean, and can you imagine the mess after they've all been taken off you? They would have been bleeding profusely. Shall we take it off now? You can really see the blood now, can't you? The harudin, the anticoagulant in the saliva of the leech, will, keep, will open that wound and keep it flowing of blood. I'm really glad you shared <laughs> that with me. Actually, leeches were only one way of making you bleed. In the Middle Ages, there were loads of others, which brings me to my next worst job, the barber surgeon. Being a barber was a very gruesome way to earn a living. In the Middle Ages, barbers were qualified to use a range of razors, knives and scalpels. Haircuts went hand in hand with amputation and bloodletting. I'm really, really ill. I think I may possibly even be at death's door. So I've pulled together my last few pence in order to invest in this man, the barber surgeon. Chris, how ill am I, actually? Well, to look at your urine sample, you are pretty ill, otherwise you wouldn't have come to me. Uh, this is the first wee of the morning. This is the first wee of the morning when the colours are its strongest, so the surgeon would be able to tell exactly what was wrong with you from that. The body supposedly contained four humours, blood, phlegm and yellow and black biles. Ill health was caused by their imbalance. To diagnose a patient, you compared their urine with charts by sight, smell well, and... and... Taste it and taste it just oh, to check. God. You don't need to taste anymore, you really don't. <laughs> but I would say that you're normally a choleric person, but at the moment it's got a bit darker, so you've got an excess of melancholy in your body. So you've been a bit down lately, you've been depressed. Yeah, just a and bit. And that's been affecting your health. Bristol City aren't winning often enough. Oh, well, it's well I can't cure that. <laughs> <laughs> There's oh, that well, these are some fairly fierce-looking instruments. Well, this is a toolkit of a professional man, a barber surgeon who's made a lot of money from his profession. Presumably these knives are for chopping off people's bits and pieces. Oh yes, this is my amputation set. If you're trying to take off someone's arm yeah. with a straight knife, you'll start off like that nicely and around there and around there. And then we've got to lift it up and get underneath it like this. It's, it's very fiddly. fiddly yes. yeah. So instead we'll have a nice curved knife like this, yeah. which will fit around like that. And in one great swoop, they can take probably three quarters of the muscle off your arm. And the back of the blade is sharp as well, so the backstroke you can just take that bit off. Just imagine having to remove somebody's limb when they didn't have the benefit of modern anaesthetics. It wasn't something people came to you for very often. They had been real extremists before they'd go to the extent of employing you to do something like that. So does that mean there wasn't much money in it? There was a great deal of money when it was available. 
but it wasn't available very often. So I had to make a living... Cutting hair? Cutting hair and shaving people. Well, these so, things are pretty much like in the barber shop when I was a kid. Well, of course, uh, the functions haven't changed. This is a horn comb, but it's still a comb. Mm. And this is a razor. It's a bit more fancy than the modern ones, but it's still just a blade. Can you stop a minute? I want to talk about something else I've just noticed. Is this what I think it might be? It is. Well, in, in the medieval times, they believed that when you swallow medicine, it'll go into the stomach and be broken down by the heat of the liver. Yeah. Because the stomach was like a small oven, which would break down things through heat. Yeah. So you have to put it in by another route. Not this route? Not that route. It's a route down here, isn't it? Absolutely. This is a clister. A medieval enema tube. We it's would... very cold, apart from anything else. Well, we can warm it. We've got to smear it, with, smear it well with lard. Yeah. So it slides in smoothly, because right. it must travel in at least six inches to get beyond the sphincter muscles. Six inches is, what, that? Yes. Yeah. Goodness me. Make your eyes water, wouldn't it? It would. And then the medicine is poured down in there. Yeah. And ram it down with your stick, just to make sure it all comes out the holes at the end. You see, you learn something watching this programme, don't you? And it's not just medicine. If you are ill, they might feed you by that method. What, up the arse? Absolutely. Really? <laughs> It didn't work, but that's what they, but they believed it would. It give the barber surgeon a laugh, wouldn't it? Especially for people he didn't like. But if you couldn't afford a colonic irrigation from a barber surgeon, then for your day-to-day -day ailments, you'd probably visit the wise woman. And when you see some of the ingredients she used in her medicines, I think you'll understand why I've designated it a worse job. A wise woman was viewed with a mixture of fear and respect. She was an Agni aunt, midwife and district nurse, all combined. The church usually turned a blind eye, but there was always the risk of being tried for witchcraft. Remedies ranged from the common sense to the nonsensical. For instance, to cure warts, just take one eel. Oh, he's wiggling. Yep, it's alive. <laughs> you hadn't mentioned that <laughs> to me. Right, where, where do I cut him? Just. Just about there, just just, about just, there. just behind the, uh, the the fins at the front. That's it. Oh he... yes, he, he will struggle. Oh, I'm not surprised. Yes, that's it. Right. Oh. Oh. Got it? Yes, done it. Wonderful. So right. which bit do we want? Now it's this bit here. Yeah. Okay. And the idea is that to use it as a wart cure, yeah. you have to then rub it on the wart. Yeah. Oops, on the affected area. Yeah. Thusly. Yep. And then obviously, once you've done that, you then take this out and you bury it, and then as this rots away, your wart will disappear, sir. Does it work? Uh, apparently so. Apparently so. Why have we got a load of worms and bits of string? <laughs> well, apparently, this is quackery medicine at its best. Uh, if you go to a, a physician who isn't properly trained, yeah. then what would happen is if you had a sore throat, they would suggest, depending on the severity of the sore throat, whether or not you would have one, two, ten or even twenty worms on a cord tied around your neck, alive as these are, and then the idea was that when these died and stopped wriggling, your sore throat would be cured. So I just put them on like this? Yeah, that's right, and they're supposed to ne go to your, next to your skin, so they go inside your shirt. <laughs> right, you hold that. OK. Here we go. They're rather cold and clammy, I'm afraid. Are we in? Oh, I've got a good mouth. <laughs> Sorry. Well, that's always one of the dangers. Yeah. OK. And then we basically just tie it off. And then, obviously... Wise woman, when... have you noticed that the, the head of this eel is still... Wriggling yes, as the, we speak. Yes, they are notoriously difficult to dispatch. Does that mean my my, uh, my wart's getting smaller? Do you uh, think? No, it's it's when it has to rot away, so it's going to take some time, I'm afraid. I think my sore throat's better. Right, we shall take this off yeah. then, sir. Oh. <laughs> Wise women tended right. to be paid by barter, so they'd have traded their cures in return for a service like having a roof fixed or a supply of food. This was medicine for the poor. But natural herbs and ingredients often had genuine healing properties. What other cures have you got? Uh, well, we have nettles. Nettles are particularly good for arthrit arthritic joints. And the idea is, is that you actually whack the joint with the nettles. And obviously the stinging of the nettles um, stimulates blood flow. 
but the problem is that you also have the sting of the nettle. Yes. Now, to counteract the sting of the nettle, what you do is you bruise nettle tips, and I have some here, and you basically just keep squishing them like that. And because you've bruised them, it's quite safe to pick them up, and then you rub that on the back of the joint. It takes away the pain from the sting. That really works? It does work. Come on, then, give us a sting. Oh, right, OK. Okay. Yeah. Oh, blimey, a sting, not a <laughs> sting. Okay, now is that stinging? Yes, it's stinging. Right, okay, <laughs> okay, right. You have to rub it quite vigorously. That really hurts you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I do apologise. Okay. All around there, yeah. So you won't be troubled with arthritic joints this weekend. Mm. You might, if this doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> How's that feeling? My hand still stings like hell. Oh, right. Well, in that case, I think a pick-me-up is, is called for. Oh, I have a pick-me-up. OK. Um, well, I have some by the fire, yep. uh, which is bubbling away quite nicely. Um, and it's worm stew. It is worm stew? Worm stew. How do you make it? Well, basically, take your fresh wormes, yes. which we have in the pot there. I've already started to cook some of them down. Uh, we've mixed in bread. A selection of herbs, some water and some butter. We know now that the worms would have provided the benefits of protein to an otherwise sparse diet, but boiling up weird ingredients could easily be construed as witchcraft. And if she was accused, there could be a high price to pay. You would be arrested. Uh, you would have trials by ordeal. You would possibly have an open grate with an iron bar in and be made to pick it up and walk across a room and set it down without dropping it. And then your hands would be tied with bandages and they would be checked after three days. And if they were festering and showing no signs of healing, then you were convicted as guilty because God would intervene if you were innocent. I think your soup's bubbling. It's not burning, is it? No, 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 no. That's, it's, it's fine. It's, it, I, I should think it's probably ready by now. It looks a bit black, but that's how it's supposed to look. There you go. Have a try of that. Oh, it's a little... Lumps in it. That's the worms. It's supposed it's to look like that. It's quite hot as well. Go on. You'll feel wonderful after it. I wish I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes like phlegm that's slightly flavoured with chicken, doesn't it? Yes, it does taste a bit like chicken and snot. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like me to take that back off you? <laughs> the wise woman and other miserable medical careers have been swept away by modern science. We've still got medieval architecture, though, but that was only built on the strained backs of a lot more people doing a lot more worse jobs. When Richard the Lionheart set off for the Crusades in 1189, he thought that by fighting a holy war for Christianity, he'd be saving his soul. In the Middle Ages, money could buy you the love of God and a place in heaven. Crusading was one way to get these spiritual brownie points. Another way was by building something big and bold for the church, like a cathedral. There are 24 medieval cathedrals in Britain. They took generations to construct. Building sites became home to whole communities of craftsmen and labourers who devoted their working lives to these monuments of medieval faith. Fortunately for us, we can get a bit of an idea of what working on a medieval cathedral would have been like because the Tower of St Edmundsbury is still under construction today. <laughs> In the 21st century Bury St Edmunds, there's plenty of mechanised help. 700 years ago, everything was done by hand, or rather by thousands of hands. Building a cathedral in the city was like bringing a new car plant to an area today. It provided hundreds of jobs high and low. But even prestigious workers like stonemasons had it tough. Before they even started building, they had the hellish tasks of quarrying and cutting and carting the raw stone to the building site. Andre Vrona is the most sought-after stonemason in the country and the master mason at Beris Nedmans. He's brought me to Kettle Quarry near Peterborough. 
to look for just the right piece of limestone for the St Edmundsbury Tower. Have people used this stone round here for building for a long time? Oh, it's been recorded as being used uh, from this area extensively since the uh, 15th century, certainly, to build manor houses, uh, cathedrals, mainly ecclesiastical buildings in, uh, north of here, south of here and East Anglia. How would they have dug a piece out? Ah, well, you can guess that these guys wedged and levered it and drove pins in and they would have just got it into the natural strata of the stone underneath it and raised it, just a small amount. Nowadays, transporting big pieces of stone is pretty easy, but in the Middle Ages, it was a real problem. Basically, you had two alternatives. You could either use water, if there was a river nearby, or else you could use a cart, which was incredibly slow and very expensive. In fact, the cost of transporting the stone could be four times as much as the value of the stone in the quarry. And when you think that a lot of the stones of the English cathedrals came from Normandy, you can imagine how much the costs really escalated. So to save money on transport, there was a team of people whose entire day was spent cleaving the stone. All right, Andre, you've got modern technology, but how would the lads have cut up these blocks in the Middle Ages? Well, it's called delving and using plug and feathers. What's plug and feathers? Are these feathers and a plug that's tapered. It applies pressure and it splits. Go on, then, show me how to delve. In medieval times, these holes were laboriously drilled with a hammer and spike. That one's tight enough, Tony. Oh, you can hear the different noise, can't you? Yeah, completely different. Yeah. So if you would like to just have a go. Yeah. A couple of taps on each one. Yeah. Oh, missed it. <laughs> Keep going. One more big one. There. We've oh, got look it. at that. Look at that. Oh, my God, it's opening up. That's extraordinary, that was like a little earthquake. It just, you just felt the whole stone move. See, I didn't hardly hit that at all. It's a simple thing, it's not a strength thing, it's a pressure, uh, and it's relatively simple and easy. Oh, look, look at this, look at this. Look, it's gone right down to the bottom. That's amazing, it's so simple, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's basically the, the form of spitting stone to get these dimensional shapes up the quarry to save them carting waste from the quarry to the site and this is how they did it. A medieval cathedral building site would have been a fantastic place. No one would ever have seen anything of this size and grandeur before, and it would have been absolutely teeming with workmen. Setters, hewers, layers, wallers, and of course, the stonemasons. Higher wages, better paid, but it would have still been a job with plenty of dangers. The master mason at Canterbury Cathedral was a Frenchman called William and he was working on the scaffolding one day, this kind of height, when suddenly the whole scaffolding collapsed and he went plummeting down. Masonry and timber and scaffolding fell on top of him and he was so badly damaged he couldn't do his job anymore and they had to send him home and an Englishman took over. Andre, it's amazing when you look down there, look down, right down here. That is so vertical. Andre, do you think that the masons in the medieval period would have been able to make pillars this straight? Oh, there's no doubt that in some cases they would, but largely uh, ecclesiastical medieval buildings in this country didn't achieve that. Why not? Because uh, over such a long period that they were built, there would have been varying different skill levels for the masons. And different people. You've different built people this whole thing. In two or three years. They were 80 to 90 years. Yeah, the problems might get lost, might they? That's, That's right. Something a bit dodgy. Exactly, yeah. Whereas you can be forgiven years ago for an inch pull it back online, but we're not allowed a quarter. So you say medieval masons might have done a bit of a bodge job? Yeah, often they did. <laughs> often they did. The St Edmundsbury right. project is using a no, medieval no, no, no. mortar made from lime. When it's mixed, it's harmless enough. But in the Middle Ages, making lime was a high-risk process for the lime burner. And believe it or not, the mortal danger came from chalk. Michael, why do you need chalk to make the things? I need chalk so that I've got something to make lime from by heating the chalk up. 
If I can heat chalk up to red heat, and hold it at red heat for a while, it'll change quite to a quite different chemical, although it'll still look much the same. And what does the lime do? The lime, I think, holds the whole thing together. It uh, binds together the grains of sand to make a mortar, and the mortar holds the stones apart in a gentle cushioning sort of way. I'm going to put a few pieces of chalk into the bottom of this. The first stage was making quicklime, a highly caustic alkaline. This is a small-scale version of the process that medieval lime burners used in their giant kilns. It was potentially deadly. Keeping the lime kiln happy means watching it day and night for perhaps 48 hours. If the burning isn't completely effective, they can create carbon monoxide. What does that do to you? It's horrible. It paralyzes you first and then kills you. It poisons your blood, it stops your blood taking in oxygen. During the process of the burn, it's not unknown for people to fall in the kiln and not be able to get out again. So they roast as well. Driving and off the oxygen in the kilns was dangerous enough. Cool that was only half the job. The resulting quicklime was added to water to make slaked lime used for making mortar. And it was a very risky business. Okay. I'll try and show you that on a slightly bigger scale. I brought on some lumps of quicklime. Very dangerous stuff. Why I'm wearing gloves, because they'll eat through my hands in no time at all. I'm going to try a Roman technique yeah. to imitate the sort of lime that we're using on the site. What, like this? In this powder form. This powder, powder form here. of lime is much, much safer than quicklime. And this is the powder that you make the mortar with. But how do you get that into powder? By adding water. It does, sound, does not sound likely, but that's the case. It's hugely dangerous. Why is it dangerous? What does it do, this it stuff? It could spit like nobody's business. So how did that affect the lime burners? Um, it was nasty. The caustic action of this on their skin was dreadful. When it got into their eyes and their mouths, yeah. they were in real trouble. Whoa! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it really goes, doesn't it? I'm going to put that in there to make it a bit safer. Yeah. But can you see how that lump has crumbled already? Yes. That was like fireworks. Quick time oh. is very thirsty material. I mean, if any of that got on your skin, it could be very painful. Mm. And they'd be handling this stuff every day, and the risk of carbon monoxide poisoning, and the quarrying, and the long nights, and the dust. They didn't live too long. It was over quickly. up to 14 storeys high. Without the benefit of the modern hoist, just lifting the huge blocks of stone to the top would have presented massive problems for the masons. As a result, they had to develop state-of-the-art lifting machinery. Imagine what it would be like walking mile after mile after mile after mile after mile and getting absolutely nowhere. Well, that's what it would have been like for the poor workers trapped inside that. Which brings me to my next worst job, the treadmill worker. I've travelled all the way to Normandy in France to see this replica, which has been designed using medieval illustrations as a guide. It was the treadmill that provided the power for the medieval crane. So if you were the one doing the treading, it was a pretty menial task, but it was crucially important. The medieval crane builders had two alternatives. They could either build a small wheel, which was pulled around from the outside, or else they could make a much bigger wheel, which was powered by two people inside. The bigger wheels could lift the larger loads, but this was new technology. The cranes were really experimental, and there was always the danger that they might collapse. So working inside that wheel could be really dangerous. The treadmill workers were the unwitting guinea pigs at the centre of a technological marvel. The cranes were built by trial and error, often breaking and killing people, then being modified and rebuilt. But they must have been pretty effective, or the buildings wouldn't have been possible at all. Medieval illustrations seem to suggest that the crane was actually lifted onto the top of the cathedral as it was being built. So the craftsman must have had some sort of way of lifting the crane up in pieces, maybe using smaller cranes or possibly a windlass. 
Here at Armby, you can see that the walls are absolutely peppered with these little holes, which would have been for scaffolding. So as the walls got higher, so the scaff went higher, and the crane went up and up and up until it was right on the very top of the cathedral itself. This was technology that had been around since the Greeks and the Romans, but it had been completely lost in Western Europe until the Normans and the French went over to Constantinople and brought it back. In fact, it was these machines alone that enabled the great medieval cathedrals to be built, because they were the only way that people at that time had of lifting massive blocks of stone the size of a car. And in fact, it's this car that we're going to lift. Michel, Frank, Ellie. How does this work? Uh, this crane works very easily, uh, you know, it's, uh, the rope is driving by the big wheels, but the rope is attached to the axle of the wheels. The way the crane works is pretty simple. The rope is attached to the axle in the middle of the treadmill, and in order to lift the car just one metre, the axle has to turn at least two or three times. Because the diameter of the treadmill is so much greater, the amount of effort you have to put in to get the car to budge is spread out over a longer distance. It's like using a low gear to pedal a bike uphill. These guys are almost ready. Shall we get in? Yes. Are you ready, guys? Michael et Frank, vous pouvez monter dans la voiture? They're going to get in while it goes up. Will they be able to take that weight as well? Yeah, or easily. This crane can take twice weight than we have actually, you know. We can take two tons. Oh, yeah, easy. Which way? This way? OK, to lift, we go this way. All right. We don't have to rush, you know. Yeah. Working slowly, we'll do the job anyway. Oh, it's going now. Look, it's really going up now. Who are the people who would have been doing this treading? Uh, most of the time, they use blind people. people. Blind people? Yes. Why was that? To secure the whole process, because if you turn inside too much, you will feel some kind of attraction for the emptiness. You mean that if you're blind, you don't look down 300 right. foot and see the terrible fall that awaits you? Right. That's very sympathetic of them, isn't it? Yeah, it was one way to... Uh, they can serve the community. Do you think they, they were working for God, you know, building cathedrals? Do you think they worked barefoot? Oh, yes, because they didn't have shoes at the time. It's going up now, isn't it? Look at that. See? You can feel the tug. You can feel there's more weight on it now, but yeah. it's not too difficult. Whoa. Should we stop now? So we turn around and put them down again? No, I've got the rope <laughs> faster. Oh, this is no problem. Yeah, slowly. Oh. Ah, we stop. Small problem here. The Everything seems of the so safe and easy because the wheels until this make more than three tons pushing and my real axle here. Of the axle. So th the axle comes out and yes. the wheel and we can go down out. to the 30 meter down. I suddenly got an inkling of what being a treadmill worker must have been like. Imagine being 200 foot up in the air and blind and suddenly realizing things are starting to fall apart. No, celui-là, il va pas venir tant qu'il va pas venir. This all may seem pretty safe, like a couple of hamsters going around in a wheel, but when you're in here, it doesn't feel like that at all. You have no control over this thing. You can't just stop it and break it, and you can't just put your hand out to stop it either, because you're frightened that as it whips past one of these things, it's going to slice your fingers off. And when you try to bring it to a halt, the damn thing just keeps moving and moving and moving, and it's wet, and it's slippy. So. When it's just going along fine, well, that's just like you're on holiday, but as soon as there's a problem... Is it OK now? Yeah, now it's pretty safe. We can finish the jobs. OK, let's have get no down. no problems. We're going down that way. Yeah, I'm keeping my hands in my pockets. After now. you, gentlemen. <laughs> I feel really nervous now. <laughs> really? I can hear the creaking on my left oh, ear. No, come on. <laughs> OK. It's the safest machine we have ever made, but we made only <laughs> one. Thank you for that. <laughs> Finding out about some of these jobs has been bad enough, but which job's on the very lowest rung? Or could I actually do it? Well, the Middle Ages certainly had its fair share of dangerous and disgusting work. Being an arming squire could be menial, dirty, unhygienic, and you could get killed. But it was a job that could lead to fame and fortune. 
Having been bitten, I can tell you that leech collecting sounds worse than it is. And practicing medieval medicine, although messy, was at least better than being a patient. Building cathedrals had its hazards, though your handiwork would outlive your lifetime by up to a hundred decades. But for me, the very worst job is one which comes from the main industry of the Middle Ages, the wool trade. If your name's Fuller, it's highly likely that at some time in the dim and distant past, one of your ancestors was involved in the job of fulling. And if manual labour is something you do with your hands, then fulling is pedal labour, because you did it with your feet. And P is the operative word, because in order to make wool soft and malleable, it had to be trodden for at least two hours underfoot in stale urine. In the Middle Ages, wool became the country's biggest export. By 1300, there were 15 million sheep, almost three times the human population. So fullers would have been thick on the ground too, a vital link between weavers, dyers and cloth merchants. You could earn up to three times as much as a field labourer. And the work was so unpleasant that this must have been little comfort. When raw wool spun and woven into a loose weave fabric, it's left dirty. It's the grease is needed to ease spun, the weaving broken. process. It's after that the fuller has to turn like this, this rough cloth into something more usable. Well, this is fine. Why don't they just put this on? Well, if you you, you need to, to, to finish it, this is when you cut this, it will fry. Yeah. And it's greasy. It is pretty greasy, isn't and it? And it's you can you can make it better. It's a felting process. It closes the fibres together. Oh yeah, you can see that they are actually. You pretty widely apart that. here, yes. whereas here, smooth and no, it just smells like Much cloth. <laughs> so how does this fulling actually work? You need water, you need something to take the grease out, and you walk about on it a lot. Do you want to have a go? Oh, I'll definitely have a go. I'm really up for this. OK, this is the upside. I get this nice vaguely amusing costume to wear, and the basic job of fulling is OK, it's just a bit boring. You're just marching up and down and up and down in a vat for seven or eight hours at a time. The downside is that I'm marching up and down in this. This is genuine human urine. This isn't a television trick or anything, it's not orange juice or dyed water, it's about 20 litres of stale urine here. If this was petrol, it would be enough to get me from here to Newcastle. And it's been kindly donated by our production team over the last couple of weeks. Thank you very much, guys, for your help with the experiment. You ready, Ruth? I think so. Then, let's get into it. Oh, it's heavy. It smells bad. Oh! <laughs> God, that smells. Oh, it's been like keeping that. <laughs> it's like raw meat. Oh. <laughs> I'm really not looking forward to this very much. <clears throat> it's every time you breathe in. Makes your eyes water. <clears throat> the flies are starting to gather around. <clears throat> <clears throat> it is quite disgusting. Isn't it? I suppose we better take our shoes off. I've got my shoes off, I have to tuck my skirt up. I think you should, love. It's not going in there. <laughs> oh, it's every time you get a, a deep breath of it, you forget what you're doing and breathe in deep and woof. It hits the base of your stomach and you want to chuck. Yeah, yeah. let's go. It's cold. Oh, I could have warmed it up warm. for us, couldn't I? Oh. Was there a special technique involved in this? Well, the important thing is to get as much movement as possible. So, dancing is probably more effective than walking, but um, basically you keep moving, yeah. and every now and then you have to stop and move the cloth. The important thing is not it... to breathe. <laughs> it's pretty vile. Oh, it is it's just dis quite disgusting. Yeah. The reason they used urine is that when it had been left for a week or two, it decomposed to produce a rich source of ammonia, which is perfect for removing the grease. They didn't have public loos at the time, so part of the job would have involved collecting it from door to door. How long did they have to do this for? Was it really seven or eight hours? It depends very much on the size of the cloth, but 
It can, yes. I mean, it can take a long time if you want to really heavy finish. The faster you move, the warmer you get. <laughs> but I don't know what you do about upset yeah, stomachs. The trouble is, when you start to move fast, you start to breathe more heavily. Yeah. <laughs> do you think it's changing the colour of the cloth at all? It's certainly changing the colour of the liquid. You can see the grease is coming out. It's gone very cloudy. It's taking the grease out. The lines in it are going. It's like a bizarre the, version of a washing powder advert. This the threads it? are actually closing up. I mean, that, I've hardly been at that at all. And you can see it's already different. It gets your toenails very clean. I'm losing the will to live. <laughs> this really is the worst job. Mind you, in a strange kind of perverted way, I think I'm getting used to the smell. Only another seven hours, 59 minutes. So after all these miserable hours of urine treading, you'd end up with this, which would have been used to make something like this, worn by the knights and squires and King Henry at Agincourt and the bishops in their cathedrals. In fact, without this worst job, the big players in the Middle Ages would have been stark naked. Join me again next time as I slide down the career ladder once again in order to look at some of the worst jobs of the Tudor period. Heads roll as I try out the messy job of executioner. Oh, look at that! Find myself on the sharp end of pin making and experience equal ah. opportunity. Ah. Ah. Ah.